Today on Artifact Academy, we talk about the top eight questions related to Artifact that haven't been answered yet and are on my mind. Uh, where this came from, I was uh, thinking recently about, you know, what are some of the things that are going on in Artifact? We don't know yet, you know, daydreaming about different possibilities. And I thought, hey, this would be a great thing to turn into a article, which uh, I wrote up and put up on the website uh, earlier today. And you can check that out at Artifact Academy dot com with a hyphen in between the link is below but i also thought i would make up a video for you friends on youtube so before we get into it there are a bunch of obvious questions that i haven't been able to you know answer in here and have an address such as you know where are all of the cards you know this is something that i think a lot of people want to know about uh or when exactly is it being released uh these are questions that um obviously are a uh, um, I think are on everybody's mind, but I wanted to focus on some questions that relate to the gameplay, some of the the, the things about how the, the games are actually going to be working, um, and uh, consider that in, instead, rather than some of these more obvious questions that I'm sure are on everybody's mind. So with that, let's get into the first one of our top eight, which is the lore. In the uh, preview uh, information that we got from some of the reports, we learned that there will be lore bombs galore in uh artifact which seems like a pretty bold promise now in my experience there are roughly two types of people in the world when it came to lore there are those who care about lore a lot and those who don't care about it at all i think that i'm actually kind of a minority where i'm in between the two of these uh i you know, when lore is done really well integrated well into a game i think it's pretty cool but when it's not really there not really in place i don't really care the Artifact world is obviously coming from the Dota 2 world uh, as a lore background, and unfortunately I don't really think that the uh, Dota 2 universe is particularly good for world building in terms of a, kind of a coherent plot and coherent narrative. We also know there's no single player campaign in Artifact, which will make it really hard to have a uh, good lore background uh, in good storytelling in the game in my opinion. So I think that it'll be pretty difficult to meet this standard of uh, lore bombs galore in Artifact, but uh, I'm looking to be impressed. Hopefully I'll be impressed. If you want to learn more about lore, though, I th uh, of the Dota universe, and you're one of those people who's in the camp who cares about a lot, uh, Loregasm is a great place to pick up a more about it. If you're not somebody who's a Dota native, uh, the, you can find a link for that below. Next up, number seven, is the use of custom game modes. Uh, this is something that not everybody's going to be excited about, but uh, you know, think about the different possibilities that are po uh, that can happen here. You could have artifact you know, puzzles, like win this turn type puzzles. You could have a custom campaign that somebody puts together, or crazy custom game modes that uh, could be wacky or fun or strategic. Um, I know that for me, I have a bunch of ideas that are going off in my head, what I dream about is a world in which there's a whole new game that comes out from the Artifact Rules engine, you know, the same way that we saw Dota come from Warcraft 3. And uh, maybe it'll become this long, strange tradition of all these games that have come ultimately from Warcraft, uh, as you see here, a little bit of a, a, a weird heritage that uh, going back a long way. Number six, we have Active Items. This is something that we haven't seen a whole lot of yet, but the one that we have seen blinked at earlier seems to be pretty important. Uh, what we know so far about it is that it gives plus two attack, but it also has the active ability to move equipped hero to another lane. This is a very powerful mobility ability, and it could have a pretty big influence in the game. Uh, depending on how this works, it could allow you to take your hero, uh, equip them with a blink dagger, then move them from lane to lane in order to activate spells and cast spells uh, of the given type at your discretion pretty much wherever you want to which is really powerful and could have big impact on deck construction now we don't really know how active items work though you know is it something that you are able to activate them whenever you want you know, is it something that you can only use them the as soon as you equip it or is it a once per turn type of thing and the exact way that those rules work will make a big impact on how powerful active items are particularly something like blink dagger which if you're able to use it multiple times uh per turn could be kind of abusable which would be a, a kind of sweet in my opinion next up number five we have unit keywords now, 
I'm a pretty big dork when it comes to unit keywords, when it comes to car design sorts of uh, topics, but I really think that unit keywords are a fascinating part of the game, and I really want to know what it will be in store for Artifact. Uh, you see here, you know, a classic you know, Magic card that has probably one of the most iconic keywords uh, from the original Magic, uh, which is, of course, flying. You flying lets you fly over ground units and evade them, uh, so it's both you know, powerful and evocative and you know, interesting as a way to play the game an element of the game so not only were these in magic but uh, you see this in other games as well like hearthstone and shadowverse uh soul forge and eternal so I, why do these show up so often why is this such a common part uh, of card games and it's not just because people you know, like them or are used to them from other games but it has a lot of uh good effects on the game design one of them is simplification and simplifying uh, different types of cards that fit together for example let's imagine a mechanic uh, or a theme that uh, valve wanted to push of hosing armor and and stopping units that had too much armor countering units with armor uh, you could have a bunch of different cards that each had their own individual way of handling this some of them that remove armor when they come into the battlefield some of them that remove it on attacking but uh, one way to, to handle this is that you just group them all together into one mechanic called something like armor piercing. And what this does is it allows new players and old players as well to understand them all together as a unit, uh, makes it easier to process mentally and um, as one element of sort of what it offers. Another is that you can then use these abilities in other places too. So you can imagine cards that give armor piercing, take away armor piercing, or then care about cards with armor piercing as well. The final reason for using keywords is flavor. You see here you know, a big you know, manticore flying in the air. This is coming from a magic card that has flying, which you know, has this you know, powerful imagery and real world connection that people will find fascinating and captivating and so using something like keyword abilities is a great way to uh, capture that flavorful connection in the case of armor piercing you can imagine that skilled assassins could use this and shows their ability to get past uh, the defenses of the opponent or big burly creatures that can just smash armor and don't really care about it uh, we do know of one keyword that's already in the game, which is rapid deployment, and it's on uh, Ricks. This is probably only going to be found on Heroes, and I'm interested to see what other keywords will be in the game. Number four, we have tournaments. In the initial presentations and reports that came out from Valve, we saw that they were promising tournaments would be an element of the game from the very beginning. We don't know what these are supposed to look like, though, and what they mean by tournaments, uh, and uh, that'll make a pretty big difference of how important these are. One mode possibility is something like a single elimination high stakes queue where people sign up and you know, maybe like it's a 16 person bracket, um, single elimination, that's going to you know, count as a quote unquote tournament. Um, I don't think this will be satisfying for people who are hardcore competitive because this would only be offering uh, small you know, event style um, participation that might be fun, interesting, but not uh, exactly leading into and feeding into an e sports ready scene another possibility is you could see daily weekly or monthly tournaments that will be happening showing here you once a month or you once every day and that these would be happening in a you know, specific format under specific rules and uh, could have lots of people in it and be much higher stakes using the si single elimination double elimination or swiss tournament style uh, tournaments here what will be especially interesting is if there are ways that you could use those events and then actually drive sponsorships to them. So if organizations like Red Bull or Razor or you know, even whoever feels like it to jump in and sponsor artifact events, that would be a really powerful tool for boosting up the esports community within artifacts. And I'm interested to see which of these format modes actually is what's meant by in client tournaments when the game actually launches. Next up, we have number three, which is limited and draft. 
For those of you who don't know, limited is a mode of uh, card games where you are able to build a deck out of a limited collection of cards. You usually open some packs and build a deck out of that. Uh, or you, you, if you're familiar with Hearthstone's Arena, this counts as a limited format. It is considered a limited format. There's some links down in the description that you, would help you learn more about this if it's something that you're interested in, uh, learning more about what limited means. Now, in the case of Artifact, though, I'm a little bit confused as to how limited is going to work with um, Artifact, as is something that's been promised to us, but how do hero cards fit into the drafting scheme? For example, if the heroes are just put into normal packs and, and then we're opening them and trying to pick out the heroes with the rest of our cards, if we don't get enough heroes in our deck, then our just deck won't work. On the other hand, if we first draft our heroes and then maybe draft cards from regular packs, then what would happen if we pick heroes of, of certain colors like red and black and then don't get any cards of that color during the draft? Alternatively, you could draft your deck first and then draft heroes second, but this comes to a different problem where you won't be able to build around your heroes if you have a defensive style deck. You want to know that you have a defensive style hero to, to fit with this. Um, I'm not trying to imply that doing draft with artifact is going to be impossible, but I wouldn't be surprised if the packs that we end up drafting with are not actually the same as the packs that we end up um, opening as regular packs. There's going to be different rules to what we can find in those packs. So one example of a of a solution is we, you could first draft one hero, then you draft a regular pack without any heroes in it, then you draft another hero out of another lineup maybe, uh, followed by another pack of artifact cards, and you just continue this until your deck is full. Um, so that's another one possibility that you could uh, see in the game. Number two is the shop. Uh, this is something that we have a little bit of information about how it works, but I really would like to know a lot more uh, about it. One thing, for instance, is that the uh, we have this hasn't been confirmed yet, but the Reddit sort of believes that the item deck is supposed to be nine cards, though uh, this is something that we really just pulling from screenshots from a few different sources. A lot of those are playing the same test decks, so whether or not this is actually true for all decks is difficult to tell. Uh, one of the things that, for instance, I can uh, see as to why 9 doesn't make total sense to me right now as a maximum deck size, if you're playing a deck that really aims to abuse the gold mechanic, like you're taking advantage of cards like Day of the Track that double your gold, then you're going to be running out of items pretty fast. Another thing that I noticed is that the 9 number doesn't make sense to me in terms of equipping all of your heroes there are a total of 15 equipment slots across all of your heroes and you're only having nine slots in your item deck seems a bit strange to me now this could be the case that nine is the the limit in all item six or nine still but uh, it would be a little bit surprising my main questions though are actually with the secret shop and knowing how the secret shop items overlap with the items that you see in a normal deck so, for instance, you could imagine a world in which the item decks, uh, items, and the secret shop items are totally separate and they don't overlap at all. You could imagine that the secret shop items are just being pulled from pool of items that could be found in items decks uh, and that they're the exact same. Uh, you could imagine that there are some items that can be found in the secret shop only and then there are some items that can be found in both item decks and secret shops or other combinations as well these details about the how the stores work i think will have a pretty big strategic impact on the game how reliable is the secret shop for giving you high power items how big can your item deck be might make a pretty big difference in deck building and viable strategies so i'm really curious as to what we can expect to see here now the number one question i'm on my mind and the mind of a lot of other players i think is the economy and understanding how expensive it's going to be to play the game and how we're going to be building our collections now i'm somebody who's been writing about and thinking about card game economics for a while now you can find some links to some of my articles on the subject in the description but it's it's something that i'm really passionate about i'm really curious as to how it's going to work in this game artifacts choice to go not free to play is incredibly bold given what you see in the ecosystem not only is this different from the 
uh, economy model that you see in Dota 2. It's also different than Hearthstone, Magic the Gathering Arena, Gwent and Eternal, and a bit most other card games that are on the market right now and that are seeing a lot of success. So it's really bold for Valve to take a different stance. I also think that the success of a, an economy and the how happy people are with the economic model makes a big difference in the success or failure of a game. And especially in the age where you know, loot boxes are becoming increasingly controversial, the gambling authorities are starting to paying attention to them and start wanting to regulate them, and then there's also been a number of really high-profile failures and slip-ups by major companies paying increasing attention to the subject. Now, some of you may be saying, wait a minute, this has nothing to do with gameplay. You said at the beginning that you wanted to focus on the gameplay. Well, this, this is one of my strong opinions, is that anything that happens inside the game is part of the gameplay. So, although it may seem like the relationship between your wallet and the game might not seem like it's part of the gameplay, I actually think the it dictates a lot of the game experience in, in a number of important ways. So, for instance, this has impacts on the rarities that you see in cards. It has impact on the trading, which is kind of a mini game inside the game. It has influence on the pack size and what the contents of the packs look like. It has influence on things like the rotation and or the existence of extended formats or eternal formats within the game. I'm going to be releasing a video on this subject really soon, talking about my theories and opinions on what this might end up looking like for Artifact and what it means to the game to be going for the not free-to-play economy, but uh, we're going to leave that until next time. I want to thank everybody for coming to hang out with me today. If you haven't had a chance, please check out Artifact Academy, the website that I'm working on to help create all of this content and release this content. Of course, please like and subscribe to support this video. Share this in uh, various social medias with your friends that are passionate about the subject. Be sure to comment, of course, any feedback and thoughts that you have. And Reddit is a great place to have conversations about your theories, about any of these questions. Or maybe share your own top questions if there's any that I missed. Thanks again for coming to hang out, and I'll see you all soon.